work session meeting to order. This work session is on Title 23 and also on uh, 2015-131. We'll first deal with uh, 23. Let's go around the table and back our social record. Let's start with you, Elvis. Elvis Green-Jackson. Dick Green. Pete Peterson. Bill Starr. Oh, sorry. Sharon Walt. Ross Nostinger. Jim Green. Patrick Flint. Bernie Hall. Bill Evans. And I got a call from Amy. She is somewhere doing under the speed limit, coming in from Eagle River. I think her last call was at outside of Fort Ridge. So she wants it to go slowly because she definitely wants to be here, but it's taken some time to get here. But thanks for being here today. So we'll turn the time of administration. Start going through Title 23. Next second. No. <laughs> Okay, uh, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the process for review and update and adoption of the building codes. And um, then we'll, there's a couple items that came up at the community meeting on Wednesday that we can address and any other questions you might have. Uh, with me is Ross Nostinger, who's the um, manager of engineering services and all the plan reviewers. Um, that's Ms. Talley and James Gray, who's a um, fire, fire inspector and also a, a fire. Uh, uh, so what ha the process is that new codes get adopted at the national level uh, by a process where code changes are put forth by the members of the International Code Council and they're um, debated and voted on at in, um, some uh, general forums. And then once those uh, adoptions are made, they're published, and then they local jurisdictions take them on and determine. It's uh, so about every three years? About every three years. This one, we're a little late in the cycle. We're about four years out now because we're about to adopt the 2000, we're proposing to adopt the 2012 code. Um, so we form committees. Once the national codes are there for us to work with, we form committees consisting of industry and staff members and review the significant changes between last time and this time. And then the committees determine if all our local amendments still apply and if any new local amendments make sense. Then the, uh, the committee generally meet um, in the early part of the year from January to April, sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, but as often as we could. And what will happen is a, an item will come up, a, a suggestion will be made, a local amendment, um, adopt the um, new change, don't adopt the new change for whatever reason. In general, local amendments are intended to relate to different climate conditions or geological conditions that you may have in your jurisdiction that um, that others don't. So uh, that's that's a general idea. Sometimes some amendments get made uh, for other reasons. Once the committees are done with their work, they get uh, staff consolidates that those results and compiles them into uh, the new Title 23 or the next cycle of Title 23, which uh, uh, the municipality assembly in pattern has been instead of just change by change, just repeal all of Title 23 and adopt the new change. So that's why you have a 267 page um, book here. Uh, then once uh, we've compiled the new changes, we take them to the Board of Building Regulations, Examiners, and Appeals. And I do want to mention, and one member of the board here today, oh, there's two. Uh, and uh, three, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm familiar with this number. And Tyler's behind you. Oh, hi. Well, the gang's all here. Um, so uh, that they're presented to the building board, which is the public process, and public hearing occurs there. The building board can make further changes or um, endorse the code of precedent. And I should mention that the committees, the different committees, are um, typically chaired by a member of the building board that's associated with that technical piece of the code. And if you look towards the back of your packet, it's about 10 pages back or so. It's exhibit A to the assembly memorandum, and it um, lists the names on the committees for this year. Uh, then once it's past the building board, legal takes a final document, puts it in ordinance form, and we bring it forth to the assembly, and that's where we are now. So, Mr. Chair, I have a question for you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So has the building board endorsed the changes? Correct. And one thing, Ross can speak to that. I was uh, not at the department this year during the cycle happened and I went to the board. Ross can speak to Okay, so let me kind of follow up with that. Mm -hmm. So the changes that are presented to the assembly for approval, the building board has endorsed these changes. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, Okay, so, uh, well, that's, that's kind of the overview.
overview. Um, some of you were at the committee meeting on Wednesday and know that a, um, a couple of members of the community came forth and asked for some additional changes, asked the committee to consider, which we spoke to briefly at that time. And uh, we're here to, at that point, it was determined that it was a good idea to have work session today to, to just discuss those couple of changes and anything else you may question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's the reason she's coming in. She has some questions about this. And some of the recommendations that came forward. So she should get here. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think, yeah, last year the Assembly approved um, an ordinance that allowed um, developers to decide who they wanted to review the plan and this guy didn't have to. Kind of kind of Yeah, what I was called. But anyway, uh, how is that going? Uh, private plan review has been in force about three years now. Is that long? I believe so. Is that long? Yeah, mm -hmm. two to three years. Uh, <laughs> it does. And, uh, you know, at the, it's, no, it's on record that the department was not in favor of, of um, the private plan review. It's limited to one and two family homes at this point, and what it essentially means is that um, the contractor, instead of using the municipal the submitting for a building permit and municipal plan review does submit for building permit, uh, but hires private reviewers to do the plan review, and uh, and so our the plan review group in this probably never sees those drawings. They go straight to they do still go to land use review and uh, traffic and whatnot, but they uh, go uh, directly for us to appeal to the structural part of it and the inspectors. Uh, the congressional at the time was that the uh, inspection, municipal inspectors would still be um, inspecting this project, so that would be an adequate independent set of eyes. Um, the concern and the inherent uh, concern and the inherent issue with a contractor hiring their own reviewer is there's uh, potential for conflict. You know, uh, you know, the reviewer wants to, uh, required to change, the contractor doesn't want to do well, the contractor paying the reviewer. And you can have an inherent conflict there. It doesn't, um, doesn't mean there's always going to be an issue there, of course, but the potential is there for a problem. So that we, we believe the staff went on record at the time still believes that independent third party is, uh, is provides better consumer protection than the private plan review process. Now, as to how it's going, um, our experience from the inspection group is that they're, uh, when they have a question or something doesn't look right to them, they take it back to the contractor, take it back to the private reviewer, and uh, they, it's determined, you know, the issues are worked out from there. We have had some problems. We have a problem in the department right now with a uh, building where the private reviewers uh, uh, missed a, an issue where we have uh, near a lot line project being built and the trusses cross the lot line. So it's designed to fit like a duplex and fit in the center zero lot line. And that's um, an issue we're sorting out right now. And we'll, we'll come to some kind of agreement on it, but it's, it's been kind of messy. I've got two assembly members and want to know for the record that we've been joined by Ms. Dabowski and Ms. Johnson. And hey. Amy, you made it. There's no red and blue lights following you, huh? <laughs> I cannot serve and I got LDL. Yeah, okay. But there was a parking spot, so it's totally cool. Mr. Star, sir, you're first. Uh, <laughs> if I could just kind of finish sure. up. Uh, oh, sure, the only other, the only other very significant thing about the um, private plan review is as long as you have less than 10 percent of your um, projects being reviewed by outside parties, the um, uh, ISO, the uh, Insurance Services Organization will still consider you for a rating uh, and, and look at your department and determine, give you a, it's a rating on the, how well you're enforcing your business with the building codes. If you go over 10%, they will, they will not rate you. And we are 35%? Yeah. So uh, from the standpoint of our permits zipping through the department, yes, they are. And uh, from the standpoint of will we, um, be able to be rated by the ISO when they come back, which is about every five years, so I mean next year and answer will be no. So that, that's uh, going to be a, a, a side effect of that ordinance. Well, to that point, that aspect of the ISO summary review mm -hmm. or the entire ISO program? The entire ISO for residential. They'll still review us for commercial. 
and again, they'll still monitor fire hydrants and all the other stuff that goes that, in the that eye That's separate ratings. ratings so yes, it is. Fire and, and, and construction. Right? Yeah, so right. it's not that they just refuse to come to Anchorage. No, they no, just, it, 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 they won't rate the residential. The permit, um, sorry, excuse me, the, the plan review, uh, excuse me, the inspection in the field changed from half an hour to something else in the fee schedule. Right. At uh, the last time that uh, the Title 22 was adopted, there was a provision, I think, was inserted by um, WO standards to uh, allow for a half hour inspection on the idea that most of our most of our inspections are built on an hourly rate. And uh, the idea was that in some cases, an inspection could be done in half an hour. And an example where that would be, um, where it's been used, uh, for example, we had some remodel work happening in our headquarters building, and um, and it obviously they went, it took less than half an hour to do the inspection. The inspector went from downstairs upstairs, fire prevention office, I think, did the inspection, and that was a half hour inspection. Our experience has been, with the exception of that, and um, a, a very limited amount of other inspections, it hasn't proven to be practical. By the time the inspector uh, you know, has the drawing, goes to the site, does the inspection, we're not finding the, a minor, minor, minor percent that are actually coming in and half an hour. We have, we've asked, we've, uh, asked the inspectors to track their time, we've asked the contractors you know, who've applied, uh, we just haven't had use of the program. I'm cautious about it from a couple different perspectives. Is the the you know, you're essentially saying then even if it's up to an hour, then is that what you're saying it's going to need to be? Correct. We're, so we're going back to the previous uh, process where the hour minimum hour starts. Yeah. So your inspectors technically on paper you won't have enough inspectors then if they're only doing eight a, eight a day or seven a day after lunch and all that. Uh, not necessarily. Well, it would can they get to? Can they do them in a half hour? No, forty-five minutes, probably. Well, no, again, the half hour is being is, is not being achieved. How does that tie into the prepaid concept? That I believe when you do the initial Title Twenty One plan plan review, you, you prepay for the, the required number of inspections. It depends on the type of project. Do you want to speak to that about commercial versus? Well, it's at one time. You, you know, now for for additions and renovations, um, we charge by the inspection for the permit fee. It hasn't always been that way. We used to charge by valuation. When we switched to charging by inspection, um, we did an analysis, and, and it was quite simple. We basically, we took our cost, divided by the number of inspections, and this is what the cost per inspection needed to be, and it was, just, and it was done per hour. If, if we start trying to fine tune this and go to half hour inspections, um, we're no longer going to be able to pay our bills, basically. Because, as you know, the 181 fund is su we're supported by the revenue we bring in. So that, that's one of the one of the issues that comes up if we start trying to bill half hour inspections for for these. Yeah, well, you know, who pays those bills? Though is not going to be happy that they've got that. And then you're going to have the argument that hey, the inspector's only here 10 minutes. Why do I have to pay for an hour? I I don't know how the rubber's going to meet the road on that. So I, I'm not certain that the half an hour inspection opportunities for the cost of inspection doesn't work somewhere. Yeah, it, and it, it has in very limited cases when we've been tracking it since it came into play. But in reality, you may be on the job 10 minutes, but you have to get to the well, job and you've got to pull the drawings at the office. You know, that's been time on that project. It's not just the time you're on. Uh, and it, it's not an argument. It's just the workforce management. If the people know they have an hour to do an inspection, there's no motivation to, to be efficient and get on to the next job. You know, offense to the inspectors, but you know, if you need them to move fast because you have a busy work day. Well, in reality, it doesn't work that way. Well, then why are you charging for an hour? <laughs> I mean, that's my point. It's, if we're going to charge them for an hour, then we ought to just say there's a flat rate cost to an inspection no matter how long it takes. Well, that's the way the original program was designed, and then Ms. Oceander changed it with these half hour inspections. Okay. Well, I, again, I'm not certain that it's that it's the right answer from a capacity perspective. If the inspectors just default to an hour for everything, 
even though they have that, then the next thing you're going to come to us and say we don't have enough inspectors. But well, the reality is the inspectors are so busy that they're not really spending time tracking their time. They're just moving from job site to job site to job site. Um, so some inspections take well more than a lot longer than an hour. We don't go back and say, oh, this inspection took longer than an hour. You owe us extra money for it. You know, it all averages out in the end. Like a framing inspection on a, a, a nice new home, it, it may, the, the inspector may actually have to go back multiple times just to get that one inspection done. Because he's got one, he's got too many inspections to do that day to spend three hours on this house. And um, well, a lot of cases, that's going to be part of your prepaid program, though, isn't it? So that's a different concept. But, but even on a renovation to a house or an addition to a house, it could be a very complicated frame. Well, I mean, I, I know the industry is calling for inspections ahead of time so that they can continue to work. So, I mean, it's a fine line between the customer service. Hey, is this going to pass inspection? No, you better do these things and I'll come back. That's, I mean, I, I see it differently. But the exemptions in a different category of, of uh, not needing uh, maybe their permit or inspection Water heaters still aren't part of it. Urinals, drinking fountains, water closets, faucets. Why can't we get water heater replacement in that concept? There's so many that are done by people, handyman, or do it yourselfers. They're so easy to do that they're made it. Why aren't they putting water heaters in that? Do not, re not require permits for water heater yeah. replacement? Well, I guess if you guys want to go that way, you can. Where's the hazard been? Um, I don't know. I mean, water, water heaters, if done them properly, um, they can be a bomb, basically, if the pressure and temperature relief valve is not installed correctly and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So I think that's probably the history behind the water heater inspection and also to see that, um, yeah. It's actually a major change in this post that we are accepting the solar mm -hmm. fixtures. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's more danger than hanging a 70 pound urinal on the wall. It's not properly secured in my opinion than, than a water heater, but I'm, I'm just speaking out loud from what I see from practical perspective. Well, the, the urinal doesn't have gas or other to it. It's safe zone. <laughs> yeah, I'm not debating you, bro. I'm just saying there's the industry is, is oftentimes compliant, but probably 90% of the water heaters installed in this town are by homeowners or somebody else, and so why make it illegal for that or give the perception that they're going to come in there and inspect all the other things that come in with that one, they should be focused only on the water here. That's the story of the year. Hey, wait a minute, that panel's not good. There is a GFI protection. Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? And then you've got a real no, it doesn't work that way. Okay. Well, when they pull the water heater permit, we go look at the water heater. So. And to clarify, a homeowner can replace their own. A homeowner is the one is the one person in the code that can do everything in their home themselves, hands on. But they still must have a permit and inspection. Yeah. For other types of work, contractors require the license contractors oh, okay. require. But a homeowner can, can do all that work themselves. They just need to have an inspection. I just themselves. just be ready. I'm gonna amend it. I don't see the need for a water heater replacement. I think it's the, the products have changed. The, I have plenty of questions that are valuable. The last one revolves around the energy code and the adoption of that. And we have previously not adopted the energy efficiency code. And they're stuck in here as that. And you're certain that the building board and those that reviewed it said that it's the adoption of the energy efficiency code were ready for that? I'm certain that it was approved, yes. But the debate was pretty driven with a lot of concern. There was no debate. Okay. Well, and I don't want to debate you, but the energy efficiency codes in a remodel application are used. That's where it has to be done, correct? If you're going to remodel a commercial facility and upgrade it from 1970 construction to that, then you have to improve the lighting efficiency as well? Well, it's more complicated than that. There's a lot of exceptions that limit the scope of work. It's existing facilities are not treated like new facilities. They do not have to be brought into compliance with the requirements that would apply to them. When would they have to be brought into compliance? Say this will while remodel and all the other stuff. That's well, well, first off, we'd have to look at it, see what, what is the degree of non-compliance and what is the scope of work to determine what would have to be brought into compliance. Well, and there's the uncertainty in the ability to bid a job or to whatever. You can't get a client to play along that long until the city decides how much it's going to be enforced. So the practical nature is the contractors can't 
can't pin down a number because it's too variable based on what you're going to say a time review. No, that's not the case at all because these commercial jobs are designed by licensed professional engineers who know these documents and work out of these documents and would design this into their design so the contractor could fit it. They'll be mad at me. All I'm telling you is if you don't have that clarity so that the International Energy Efficiency Code is going to be adopted in the municipality, I want to make sure industry knows it. And you're saying no debate occurred? I find that hard to believe. That's, that's a very costly... Well, I'd, I'd like program. to point out, if you go to the exhibit A, there's, oh, I don't know, two dozen people on the 2012 Energy Code Committee, and this came out of this committee. Um, I'm looking at industry people, Jim Ward, uh, Royal Fields, Andre Spinelli, uh, Mr. Steele, who's here today, who was chair of that committee. Okay. I get it, but I don't think that the, the residential energy efficiency codes, besides... Uh, the extra insulation and still play and some of the other stuff is, is going to be the, the cost that's going to be incurred at the commercial level with dual state balance and all the other stuff that goes into it. I understand. It's very that. expensive. I understand. I just want to point out that industry is highly involved in reviewing whether or not to adopt any yeah. code and that committee forwarded that it should be adopted. It's, it's a highly complicated conversation to have and no offense to the assembly, but they got to understand how much it costs the commercial remodel project. And if you can't pin down when you're going to apply it, then I can't put an SEE to that part of the of the of the code change. Oh, we turned it down before, and we may have to debate it again. I'm glad that you brought up the timing because our goal is to have this adopted by the end of the year, so that we can make it effective January one. Industry is ready. Industry is waiting. What day do we start? Thanks, Mr. Thank Thank Chairman. Mr. Mr. Clinton, Mr. Nabowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Andre. Back there? Yeah. Can you come up for a second? <laughs> so, so, since you were on the uh, Energy Committee, could you speak specifically to the, what conversations took place? Well, in the Energy Committee, we didn't really debate whether or not to have an energy code. I don't think that there was. We really talked about that at all and from my standpoint if there is going to be an energy code I at least want to be there to talk about how it could be if, if. so there wasn't that debate didn't really take place Mr. Glenn anything else yeah um, you natural draft water heater, 
and they're all vented into a common chimney that goes up to the roof. Um, the homeowner decides to install a high efficiency condensing furnace. They now take the biggest load off that vent, and they, uh, it, it, because this new condensing furnace requires a separate type of venting system to the exterior, now the vent is way oversized for the appliances that are connected to it. And it may not draft appropriately. And so what that's meant to address is to make sure that if that's the case, that they may have to install a new vent that's sized appropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Bowski, ma'am? I am so sorry I was late. It seems like you guys were pretty far along. Have you already had uh, the homeowner or the builders the no. location? Okay, so I might wait until after they speak to their requested changes, but I'll just let the assembly know just to tune in to where we're talking. On page 224 of 266, it's section 23.85.R802.12, option five. This is the ventilation issue that we discussed in committee. Essentially, the blocking in between trusses, I don't know if they got their roads today, but it was, bring your it was very helpful. So when you set a roof, you have trusses, those triangle things, and in between they put blocking. Currently, previously, for 20 plus years, I was told, they used solid blocking. And so they could insulate all the way up to the roof. The current a proposal changes that blocking to put ventilation holes in it, which means they can only insulate most of the time. Okay, okay, whatever. Well, and there's an icing issue because of the way that it's being changed. That's one of the questions. And then they, they talked about ventilation too and concern about mold. So that issue they'll talk about. Um, and then the other major change, which I don't know if Sharon addressed or not, is page 221 of okay. of 266, and it's section 23.85.R501.3, and it's fire protection and floors. And um, I'll let them speak to it because this one's a little bit more complicated. Um, actually, obviously, they both are because I know that's the first one. Um, so those are the two kind of main changes um, that they're rec uh, they're asking for in the proposed code. So I just I'll, I'll wait till after they present the top five. Andre, who's doing it? Who's doing it? Um, I'll I'll I will. <laughs> Take about five minutes. <clears throat> sure. And then we'll do some questions from the second. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I'll start with the trust blocking issue and um, what. Just to give you a little history, um, around 2003, we switched from the Universal Building Code to the International Building Code. And in that, at that time, the trust block and municipality changed the way what they were trying for trust blocking. So, approximately in the early 2000s, we switched to this new style, which is the blocking extends all the way to the roof sheathing. Then we drill two inch holes a, a couple inches down from the roof sheathing. And that's the screens across the with, with bird screens across. But, uh, and that's how the airflow gets into the kind of smallest part of the roof where you need the most ventilation because there's, that's where the heat from the house is closest to the roof surface where the water and ice and that's why you see buildup in that ice buildup and ice dams kind of typically in those areas. It's because there's kind of a little amount of ventilation there. And then any other form of ventilation within the space of the attic, it's hard to get the air ventilated through that kind of small triangle. So anyhow, the once the municipality switched the requirements, we switched to the new style blocking. Um, there's a, the new style blocking doesn't work as well for a couple of reasons. The first being there's not nearly as much airflow. The second is the airflow is blo broken up into circle rather than one continuous member. And the third is that the wood block now extends to the roof creating a thermal bridge. And then the fourth issue is that there's baffle that put, holds the insulation off the roof because we have an 11 and a quarter inch heel height there. And a lot of times our roofs will have more than 12 to 16 inches of insulation. So we have a baffling in there that holds the insulation away from the roof to allow for ventilation. So 
sometimes that baffling will block half those holes in them. Basically take the limited amount of ventilation that the blocks with the holes in them provide and cut it in half. So in the 2009 and again in the 2012 code, there is a standard detail that popped up that wasn't in the code before. And basically it says in our seismic design category and in wind speeds of 100 miles an hour or greater, you can use this detail. Well, it turns out the detail is the detail we used to use. And so in the meantime, builders have been complaining about this ever since the municipality changed it. Myself and other builders have brought cases to the building board. And since then, the municipality has worked out several versions of compromises where we've got a, a handout with five different options. And um, basically, our intent now is to go back to the original option and allow it to apply to all single-family homes, regardless of the design category, and it just kind of mimics what the code says. So what we did is we suggested that option five in section 802, section 802 is the Muni handout. It's not in this code in section 802. It's the Muni took their handout and inserted it into 802. We said option five, we want to refer back to the details as prescribed in section 602, which is in this code, which does apply to our side and side. <laughs> Do you have a question on this? Side? Yeah, is it strictly <coughs> changed to prevent the trusses from racking? Cross your path. Well, the the, the 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 structural intent of the block is to and to prevent it from racking. Yeah. The reason the municipality has denied it is because there's a section in the code that says you can't load a member with, with like in the in the uh, direction of cross grain bending. And so the truss, there's an inch of truss there that is getting loaded. And, and we've never seen the structural failure there. And But the code says you just can't load things that way. Even though we've built like this for a long time, there's, and even nationwide, I don't think they've had examples of structural failure so in this direction. Doesn't the strength from the OSB and the nailing pattern of the roof that way? Well, Mary later, doesn't it? The way loads work is the, the loads start at the top and they carry all the way down. So the load between the, the roof and that blocking, there's almost no load there. I mean, it's very little. Without looking at the design, you did this in your work session yesterday, probably, then you would have no blocking there. You just go back to full bird screen. <coughs> yeah. If, if basically, the yep. block, there was a block that if this was the roof, uh, there was a block that extends up to the roof. What yeah. we did prior to that was we held it down. And whether you soffit the location or not doesn't matter in the construction. If you soffit it and drill your hole in the soffit, then technically none of that other stuff matters anyhow, right? Well, yeah, I mean the soffit is going to be a yeah. measure choke point for the ventilation. Well, here's your holes in the soffit. Well, well yeah, or provide the drain of the soffit. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Rejects on this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I heard you say that they were compromised with the administration, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. And now the proposal or the proposed amendment is to go back to the original um, way of doing business, correct? Um, well, our proposal is not necessarily by, I mean, it's code, so it's very technical, but. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we do want to go back to the half the original the, the partial height block. Right. Is that the policy? Okay. Well, what I would like to hear what the administration has to say. So, I'm working on the building safety plan review. So, um, this the entire idea behind this one. Uh, there's two issues. One is the ventilation of the roof cavity to, to preclude ice damming melting of the roof. We uh, recognize that, but there's also the structural aspect of it where you're looking at what's happening with the roof system and how that ties in through the trusses into the supporting walls. And so there's a, this conflict between the two requirements. How do you provide enough ventilation? How do you provide adequate structural connection? The codes in years past, um, prior to 2003, was the Uniform Residential Building Uniform Building Codes. In that, and subsequently the CAVO, which is the Council of American Building Officials Residential, Residential 1 and 2 Family Plan, 
All of that allowed for what is considered prescriptive cookie cutter houses, single family duplex applications, where they just took dimensions and try and work within the, the recipe for constructing what's considered a prescriptive house. We don't see that very often anymore. Most of the houses that we see nowadays are fairly complex offset roof lines, offset wall lines, different pitches, different types of release and facades, partly um, due to changes in Title 21 over the years, partly due to change in the nature of the market. And so that's introduced a little bit of complexity with regards to how to deal with the engineering side of these things to make sure that the structure remains uh, durable and stable. Um, I wasn't sure at the time when the transition occurred between the original partial pipe blocking, which was permitted on all the ones you then do on to the, the current state of the that we're on now. But the one thing that I want to emphasize is that this particular item is a connection issue. Connections within structures are the most critical item. If, I, if you look right above you, you've got this suspended ceiling grid. You've got all of these materials, but none of it would be here if it weren't for the connections. They would all be on the ground because of the connections. If the connections fail, you start seeing failures. And the approach that we took on this one was there was national testing. There was two separate tests that were done in 2007 and again in 2011 that tried to address this particular issue. <coughs> Um, and the tests were actually done by independent agencies and also by the National Association of Home Builders. They were involved with a lot of the testing. And what they showed is that is it possible to do it? Yes, but to, with limitations. And the policy that had come out of, or the, the handout and details that had come out of it in option five is building safety's interpretation of those test results. What um, the home builders want to do is just ignore the test results and go back to uh, what was originally done. And that's a difficult thing from an engineering standpoint to swallow because of the fact that they're disregarding what the national level has established as a potential issue. And we're not talking seismic, we're not talking or just seismic or just wind, but it's a connection issue. And so the department is willing to work with the home builders and say, okay, is there new evidence, is there new information that we can enhance what we've got here? But we don't have that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Starr, and then Mr. Bass. Well, none of you addressed the need to move more air through that cold space up there in the baffling. You know, if they're the standard cardboard of the foam bath and only pulls it down, and it's going to hit that hole if you make them drill it like it's specified in the drawing. So you're going to block that. So you didn't measure that. Second question I have is does the nailing requirement require that the first stop be, be nailed to the sill plate? It does. And so the, the locking is going to be attached to the top plates. And oftentimes that's going to be done either. Uh, with a framing clip, sometimes it's going to be done with two nails. Sometimes the framers will actually run the sheathing up onto the, the and nail onto that. And nail onto that. We don't have a hurricane clip requirement then in conjunction with that. Not for the, the block to the plate. No. Those clips are required, but that's separate. Requirement. That's a separate but requirement. Doesn't but the hurricane clip do the structural requirement? First off, I've not seen a ton of roof blow off. So if you're changing the scope of concern to that separation <coughs> of that roof membrane. Come off. That's new to the, me. I the, the, roof, the roof blowing off is a separate issue. Those are addressed with different types of questions. Structurally, you're talking about the roof racking? We're not so the snow roof? We're talking about what's happening when the roof sheathing starts displacing under either a wind or seismic event, and how that force gets transferred from that level down to the walls that are supporting it. And usually that's going to be through the, the blocking keep it from racking, provide some level of stability and strength to transfer the loads. No, I, I mean, I'm not an engineer, I don't want to challenge you with that, but we just haven't seen picture after picture of that implosion occurring in our high wind zones. I have, honestly, I have not seen any information as to what the maximum design speeds we've actually been seeing. Well, we see a we have we have we've got 
got map wind speeds, design wind speeds up to 125 miles an hour. So now we're starting to argue about what's valid data and applicable thereof. I, I'm all for so, building caution, but the trade off okay. between the cost of, of the improvement and the functionality of the design has got to collide here somewhere. And so when Ms. Gray Jackson asked for flexibility, it doesn't seem like there was a compromise. They're, you're so far apart. And especially when comments are, we don't understand why they wanted to gravitate back to something that would be so structurally unsafe. I don't think they structurally want to go back to unsafe. They just don't want to come back to deal with ice standing warranty issues and all the other stuff. And I appreciate that. Okay. Well, so what's the clarification? You, you, you can't adequately ventilate an adequate these designs. Pardon? You can't adequately ventilate an adequate these designs and not have ice standing. Mr. Nabowski. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to have some comments, but I have a couple questions um, from these presenters. Mr. Michelson, how long have you on the building looking for? Almost 20 years. And you, I see in here, were a member of the ICR review board? I was a member of the IRC. Oh, okay, this. so um, this issue did come up in that committee. And what was the recommendation of the IRC at that committee? recommendation of the committee as Mr. Spinelli has talked about was to reduce it to two-thirds high blocking so if you have an 11 and a quarter inch heel you use a nine and a half inch cross which gives you about an inch and three quarters of airspace across the top half of the truss plate which is the most adequate ventilation. If I may add to that I just did a Miss um, Walsh mentioned before and I appreciate you calling on me that we had this and she did say that the members of the bid of the building board was supposed to chair the, the committee she walked in and said that she was going to chair this committee but i was not going to chair it she wanted to take it over which was odd in the first place and it started the conflict that we had already but besides that i just did a house for a doctor i'm not going to tell you the address but we took we cut out the holes he had not he had five to eight inches of icing every year this is a new house that I didn't build, someone else built. He says, you gotta fix it, Paul. So we're not gonna say the only way to fix it is to break the law, if you want to call it. I cut his blocks out, gave him two inches of airspace, and redid the softening down below, created air, and to, I went over there just yesterday with a half an inch of snow on it, and the snow stayed right on the roof, just perfect like it's supposed to perform. Okay. So, so it went from eight inches of ice every year to nothing. Just to pull me back in, so, my question being, the committee that you sit on, this was discussed, mm -hmm. and the committee... The committee approved going back to this method, and Andre Spinell took it further, Andre Spinell, Mr. Spinell and Mr. Taylor, mm -hmm. took it further, and af after the code was, after the amendments were sort of approved. What we've always said, before, the, before Title 23 went to the Assembly for approval, the industry wanted the opportunity to review all the amendments because staff takes all the comments and adjusts the amendments and then it's supposed to be dispersed. And we wanted the opportunity to talk to the assembly before it was approved. But this particular was discussed. issue wasn't brought forward is what you're saying? It was brought forward at that time and we were, but and I mean, you can help me, we weren't really shut down, but we were basically told unless you perform Unless, testing, unless, unless we perform the, the industry us as home builders, unless we paid twenty to forty thousand dollars and had a test proved to prove that we weren't gonna break every truss in a thirty foot span. Unless we could prove that they weren't going to accept okay. it. So okay. what we did, we actually approached UAA, I approached UAA uh, engineering department and asked them if they would perform the test, they wanted twenty eight thousand dollars to Okay, so I, I need to, um, I'm going to hone it in and just kind of go a little faster. So um, to, uh, one comment I'll bring from the committee is um, Andre made the comment, and he, he talked about two houses that he built, one with the old style trussing, uh, blocking and one with the new style. And when you go and view those houses, one would have icing and one would not the new style. So I think from the assembly's perspective, number one, one of the questions we have to ask is, what is the problem we're really trying to fix, and is there a problem? And do they have a valid concern? But the other question, the comment that is really significant, when we have these ventilation issues, uh, mold becomes a real big problem. And so, um, Mark, I'm gonna go back to you, and before I make my comment, um, I want to be very clear, this is not a debate, but I want your just candid, succinct answer. 
Um, I'm, I'm perplexed by your statements today about the testing because in the committee meeting, um, you said very, very clearly nationally they were supposed to be testing the kids do it. And then you said the municipality was going to do it, but like, clearly it wasn't there. Okay. So this is a policy. So I'm confused as to what you're talking about. Okay. So what I said at, um, at committee was that there, there was national testing that was done, but there was no reduction of that data so that engineers could use it. Because test data is not very useful, but having some um, results and how you apply that is very useful. So that hasn't been done or was not done at the industry level. Building safety staff took that information and tried to do what the industry normally does and reduce that information. And what we came up with is the results in options. I appreciate that clarification. My second question for you is, are you aware of and how many of these failures have been seen in Anchorage? I am not aware of any failures in Anchorage, but I'm also not aware of any design here. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, design level wind events where this is uh, a prevalent type of construction. I just about can. It may just be my own. I appreciate that. Now I'll ask the same question to either whoever wants to answer. Are you aware of any failures in the neighborhood? And how many? Mr. Dombrowski through the chair of train. The, we, had, we had some wind, some roof damage failure and the wind wind damage prone to the wind storm of 1981 and what it was was it was tested was over a million dollars worth of damage done in the city of Anchorage most of it was shingles and some plywood there was no cross shear bending trusses at all damaged in the wind. and I've been here 40 years no, no. the insurance companies attributed about 95 percent of the roof damage <laughs> to caused by the wind was due to poor fastening of the plywood at the time. But there has been no failures documented. And we, I've looked into this, I have I, I deal, I'm, I sit on ICC's committees, I sit on three committees for National Association of Home Builders. I'm associated with many individuals throughout the United States. I've brought this discussion up. I, I probably 250 builders I know throughout North America. I can't get one of them to tell me of a failure of cross year in a trust system due to two thirds of my block. I, I appreciate that comment. And I'll just wrap up. I think I think I've I've kind of uh, made my point when, by asking the questions, but I'll just ask and I think it would be very helpful for some of the assembly members who aren't here too or who didn't see the presentation at the committee meeting. Um, if we could get one of you guys to bring the trusses and the differences in blocking and explain it at the assembly meeting on Tuesday, that would be, I think, very helpful. And, um, yeah, and I think, I think that would be very helpful just so people can get a visual. Um, but again, this will be um, a topic of discussion, and I will have an amendment that will be discussed and debated by assembly members specifically for this issue. Thank you. Time wise, we've got to be out of here by 12 45 because you've got one o'clock to oversight library we need to be at. And one other thing, you're going to be getting an email from a clerk's office today on a internal audit that was done on the Bicentennial Commission money, how where it was spent. So you'll be seeing that today. So I just want to let you know ahead of time. So I tell you, when media calls you, you'll be yeah. getting a call on it today. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Starr, and then we'll move on. Well, just a point of comment. I think there's so many different ways you could have. You could have your first course, so your roof decking could be plywood. You could get a changing nailing pattern. You could go to ring shape nail systems. There's a whole host of solution-driven things, and we're not we're not getting them. So I hope the nuances when we ask for caution and discussion to continue, especially on Tuesday, is just that. There's a whole host of comments in there. Mr. Spinelli, did you guys talk about the full sheeting requirement or the full uh, water ice damming requirement <coughs> all the way to the top of the roof now, greater than 412? No, we we don't. We, uh, we, I don't, I don't think I had it. Yeah, but you built nothing greater than 412, though, right? Less, uh, less than 412? No, we built 212. And you're going to have some water shield the entire roof? It's kind of a, uh, 
CYA thing for me. Yeah, good. When I build a slope that low, I think <coughs> spend a little bit up front to avoid problems in the field. And then the insulation categories down there with the cavity requirements and the crawl spaces and all that, you studied the cost of all those requirements? Um, it's, you're talking about the energy code? Yeah. And the, and the uh, my, my, just my two cents on the energy code, I build a house, my standard house is above and beyond what's the minimum proposed by the new. My feeling on it is that what we are, what process we already have in place, um, this isn't required, but this is what Spinel Homes has done for before I worked at Spinel Homes, <laughs> was that we get an energy rating that's, um, it's rated by third party, um, private energy rater certified through HFC on every single home we do and we um, record that against every house. Uh, so my fear is that when we're like the, the inspection issue you were talking about before, my fear is just adding a new category of things for the muni inspectors that would duplicate what the process that we already have in place. So if you can already get a class five, then the blocking and the insulation requirement and sealing of the seal plate with that fancy caulk and the labor intensive plastic, if you don't have to do that, if you already got a five, is, is, that, is that acceptable to you? Yeah, I, uh, we, we use what's called the performance method, which is where you have an energy rate come out and rate every single house. And then you they rate it according to the star rate. And then the other option is you do it prescriptively where you just and, and I guess, folks, that's a nuance that's important is that you know we can prescribe all the other stuff, but if we're already getting it without some of the stuff that's required, you're trading off cost, labor intensiveness, and effectiveness. Why do it if you, you know, perhaps the same natural gas like the header of the thing says, there's a whole host of reasons to produce the resources, but the cost and burden on the developer becoming bureaucratic as opposed to practical. Thank you. Barbara, you had your hand up. Um, thank you, Mr. Trainee. I just wanted to comment that the assembly has a general policy at assembly meetings not to have displays at meetings. Typically, you have displays and handouts at your committee meetings. Of course, the assembly could always suspend the rules. One option might be an email or something to that effect so that the information that Ms. Demosky's committee had would be able to get to the whole assembly. Okay, thank you. And we tell Bill not to bring that big piece of wood again. Cool. Uh, he made comments on the second piece of wood. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you for your people. Mr. Chairman, yes, I appreciate that. I, I, I'm going to push back a little bit on our team clerk, who I think is fabulous. Um, because sometimes when we have road drainage projects, it's been very common for people to bring big billboards and pictures and stuff, and I would consider those displays that people allowed. Well, I've seen the, I've seen the demonstration that can make it's a piece of wood. It's helpful. So can we just start with, I didn't know the administration is very passionate about this issue, so can we just start with letting them present? Absolutely, I just want to. And then um, after that, I would like to let them present their side, just like we did at the committee both yeah. sides and we can wait in. Go ahead. Okay. Mr. Chair, the second uh, request that came up at committee was um, in terms of there's a new requirement for fire protection of floors that um Ross, do you want to see that exact requirement? That's not in this is it's actually in the body of the code. Page 221 of your um document. So we're looking at 20 Mr. Chair, 2385 R501.3 and the current uh, current amendment, local amendment was allowed was um, <coughs> For fire protection floors to add the following sentence to the end of exception two, which exception two is well. First of all, the um, require the new requirement itself is floor assembly is not required elsewhere in this code to be fire resistant rated to be provided with half inch gypsum wall board membrane, five eighths inch wood structural panel membrane, or equivalent or the underside of, on the underside of the floor framing membrane. In other words, um, put protection on the other side of the joist. Um, exception two for that is floor assemblies located directly over a crawl space not intended for storage or direct or fuel fire appliances. In committee, uh, a uh, amendment was 
uh, proposed and accepted to um, allow, also add direct vent sealed combustion fuel fire plants shall be allowed without floor protection having to do with the nature of those kinds of, of that kind of equipment um, being determined to be of less risk. What the requirement, the request made at committee, <coughs> the, the recent committee meeting on Wednesday was that floor assemblies located directly over a crawl space for an unfinished basement not intended for storage or fuel fire plants. In other words, to ex also exempt any unfinished basement from having to protect the ceiling, basically the ceiling of the basement or the underside of the floor in between. Um, this actually, uh, in a vote of the committee, passed by, this was proposed then, and it passed by one vote. And this is the one item that I, as chair of the committee, put on record that I would not put forward, even though it passed by one vote because it has to do with life safety and the, the um, purpose of the entire amendment has to do with um, as the use of light frame construction came forward uh, or was being used more and more which are the, the um, TGI joists, the light composite joists versus the solid timber joists as those were beginning to use more and more they're also accompanied with um, an increase in firefighter death and injury because in a fire, the way they fail is instantaneously. The, the blue composite joist will kind of heat, 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 and boom, they'll, they'll fail right away. Whereas a timber joist will fail in a more elastic manner, gives the firefighters warning about what's um, going on. Um, I have for you, and you can read it uh, separately, a position paper that was put out by the International Association of Fire Chiefs that. Um, that uh, describes in uh, describe the basic problems with this, and there it is such serious issues that this amendment eventually made its way into the code, or the um, change eventually made its way into the code. At the um, IRC committee meeting, Chief Pignola, who's now retired, came and gave a half-hour presentation, um, seriously requesting the committee not to amend this requirement to allow this uh, protection requirement to go forward because of the, um, the risk to the uh, first responders and firefighters. Uh, so I, as a building official, uh, would not put that request forward. Uh, it's, our duty is to protect the health and safety of the public and the people in the structures, and I could not good conscience uh, put that forward. So I announced that I would uh, not be including that in the, in the amendments, that they could make the case of the building board, or they can make the case to you, uh, but the department was not going to endorse that by putting it forward. And we also have here, if you uh, could ask you uh, Connie Ernst from risk management, familiar with the situation, and uh, James from uh, fire, who can speak to it as well. Okay, James, you want to say a quick yeah, word on that? Just briefly, I think the fire department's largest concern is these sort of uh, occupied spaces, I want to say occupied in quotes, an unfinished basement, so a house is built. Uh, with an unfinished basement that has these exposed TJ address in the ceiling. Uh, they are very common in construction. We, it's well documented that they fail faster and they fail more suddenly than dimensional lumber does. Uh, we've got some great YouTube videos I'd be glad to share with the assembly uh, if you'd like to, to see those with uh, full scale tests and small scale tests have been done. We know they fail earlier, but the question is do we want those unprotected without sheet rock in them in an unfinished basement? In a, in a home that a homeowner takes uh, that takes occupancy in, where we do potentially have a fire risk in that space. Maybe a crawl space, are we agree that not, not a place where we get a lot of fire starting, but unfinished basements, um, we certainly do. Um, I, I've got plenty of data that came on with all kinds of things about firefighter fatalities. Between uh, 1997 and 2006, we had 250 firefighters die in communities, suffered structural fires, uh, from, from these 44 were killed as a result of structural collapses. And uh, the, the, the city of uh, Milwaukee, uh, a, a, a TV station in Milwaukee did an expo day on this and they actually built a scaled model and they interviewed some firefighters for their fatality and then there were some serious injuries on the floor that just collapsed out from under them. Um, additionally, I know everybody's in a hurry. I asked uh, uh, Chief Boyd from the fire department he made that presentation that was referenced um, last year that Chief Ignola uh, presented. Firefighters are incredibly passionate about this and they don't typically get excited or involved in the, the fire prevention building 
building code stuff like they do on this issue. That unfinished basement, it, it seems to kind of be a water loop for, for uh, loss of firefighter life. Thank you. Uh, but I, you guys wanted to change this? Well, we, we, well, the code now doesn't require it. So every house built today, tomorrow, or next week, or for the last 50 years was built this way. And so what we've proposed to do is slightly more restrictive than what is allowed today, but not quite as big of a step as what this code, this brand new code has Asked for. Thank you. I've got three assembly members. Mr. Edwin, sir? Yeah, and I think the inspector answered my question, but just to be sure, I couldn't, I, I wasn't sure what the distinction was why we were allowing it in crawl spaces and not unfinished basements. It seems like the risk would be the same. Uh, but if, if I understand you right, you think there's just a greater likelihood of fires uh, starting from a, an unfinished basement than it would be in a crawl space. Is that it? That is correct, and that's also documented in all the NIOSH data that we collect on uh, where fires start. Thanks. Mr. Starr and then Ms. Tabowski. And well, I certainly Starr. don't ever want to jeopardize a fireman's life by any means. And, and in my building careers, we've paid big attention to, to how exit pans do separate exits. I fire crew that enter the building, so there's a you know, sense of nuance there. But my observation would be that you could solve the problem through a, a, a fully jip created mechanical room if you have mechanical in the basement meaning water heater your furnace boiler all the other stuff is in the basement uh, I would say that you could you could sheetrock the entire cavity and probably provide additional time for those fire crews to get down there versus the whole thing and then in the crawl space scenario a lot of the spinel design not to pick on your design in particular has you know a four foot crawl space which facilitates underrunning the ventilation and the wiring and all this stuff there's virtually uh, no designs that have mechanical down there fire starting potential in a short electrical are you really going to make them sheetrock all that? That's going to be very labor intensive to lay on your back and sheetrock the key membrane before. And I just, I think again, another case of where industry can perhaps weigh in on solutions driven of fully encased mechanical rooms, fire rated doors, if you're going to do it. Or maybe the requirement that mechanical exposure is down there, then you, then you do it. But I mean, just blatantly saying it, I don't know that that solves the problem. Ms. Spowski and then Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I'd like to defer some of my time to let them just have a couple minutes to respond. If I may, Mr. Spowski, through the chair, Ms. Jim Green. The, the situation is a many fold issue. The, the unfinished basement issue, if you hang sheetrock up there, Ms. Powell is going to want you to finish your wiring up there. So if you finish your wiring up there, it may not be conducive to the floor plan that you have in the future. Ms. Powell has said, well, you can take down all the sheetrock and we're going to do the addition. So, okay, so you put 2,000 miles worth of sheetrock up there, take 2,000 miles, throw it away, and then do your finish and then go up. I agree with you that the, the problem I have, and Mr. Gray, I don't want to argue with him at all, being the committees I sit on at the National Association of Home Bills, the fire department has never, they have statistics, but they've never shown what the statistics are. Are they new houses that the firemen haven't collapsed, or are they old buildings? In Anchorage, many statistics I've seen, they're trailers, they're mobile home trailers. They're not, res they call them a residential house, but it's not a house. Fire fatalities in houses built from 2000, <coughs> actually from 97 to 2015, has dropped almost 96%. They don't take that into consideration. So all the failures that happen, structural failures are, are pre-2000, pre-2006 homes. With the introduction of the trust joystick, I'm not going to say they burn, I haven't seen the studies where they burn faster or slower. A fireman's job inherently is dangerous. I don't want to kill any fireman either. God, I don't want to do that. I have lots of friends that are firemen. But show us statistics that work. I like your approach. <coughs> if you have a fuel fired appliance in, a, in, a, in an unfinished basement, you just sheetrock just that portion. Because right now you don't have to do that right. method either. So sheetrock the boiler. She rocked the lid, she rocked the walls. I think we can accept that. Overdoing the entire unfinished basement. Because I'll tell you guys, when we build a house and it has an unfinished basement, if we try to lay out the basement the way we think it's going to work, inevitably it's wrong. Almost 100%. Okay. So I, I, I don't feel But the statistics, you really have to look at the statistics closely and look at the new construction over the last 15 years. Okay, Mr. Cheney, if 
if I may, I'll defer to Ms. Johnson and let other assembly members answer the question if there's time, and I'll answer this one. Actually, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Mickelson hit what I was going to ask about. James, any quick comment from you on this? Just, thank you, though, Mr. Chair. Just uh, primarily to the issue that, that's before you in the code, we're talking about these unfinished basements. We're not talking about cross spaces. So this is this is primarily the, the, the trust choice on the ceiling in the unfinished basement. And I would say there's lots and lots of homes that were finished as an unfinished basement. And I bet everyone in the room is, knows a place they can go in where they have filled it up with furniture, they made it a rec room, they made it a blue room, and those trust choice are still hanging out of there. That's really our concern. Fire load in that space, exposed to trust choice with no sheet rock on the okay. I'm going to go to Ms. Johnson now because we're running out of time, but it's 12 45, we've got to hand this in the library. Um, Amy, also on uh, 215 131, did that come through your committee? No. Well, to be fair, I think we saw it along the owl quite a while back, but our committee did not have time to bring it up. Okay. So um, I, I know Mr. Hall, we were talking about it too. I mean, we, had, we wanted to bet, we just ran out of time because this was such a big issue. Okay. Okay. And we need to deal with the issue. Come on. Yeah. Um, okay, Amy, I'll leave the final comments up to you. Thank you. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so I, I guess I, I guess the takeaway for uh, for me, when I hear your statistics, I, I want to be clear that I understand them. When you said um, there are 250 and then 40 something due to collapse, are we talking about all collapses or the collapses or specific to this issue? All collapses. Okay. So we're not differentiating at all how many are due to this the sheet rock floor failure thing. So through the chair, Mr. Melsky, uh, the statistics don't differentiate the lightweight construction and those collapses that kill firefighters. However, there is lots of anecdotal information, video, NIOSH has all kinds of information about I would be more than glad to send you that data. It's, it's, I have stats up here, but it's, it's more than we can present at this particular case. I definitely will, will look at that, but I, I guess my question to you is we have these statistics that on first blush look um, look very concerning, but now I'm hearing they don't, they're not really specific to this one specific issue alone. So I have to weigh that with also, we have a problem with affordable housing. So now we're making a new code essentially um, to really increase the cost to the homeowner. And really, um, so I guess my second question is here in Anchorage, Sharon referenced that there's been two firemen that have, because of this issue, that have, uh, and, and I don't know if you actually said because of this issue, but there's two firemen who said that they've been I am, I mean, I, I'm, under, I'm aware of Billy when the, when the porch collapsed on him, but I don't know specifically about these cases in Anchorage. Can you specifically attribute that to this particular issue? Was this trailer with the house, or are you familiar with them? So through, through the chair, uh, Billy's case was probably the shoddy construction outside that had nothing to do with this construction. I, I don't know that we have a specific case in Anchorage where that has occurred, but it's important to put this in perspective. This this is a unfinished basement <coughs> that gets a lower valuation rate, so it's it's got a cheaper permit fee, it's cheaper built, and it's left in an exposed condition for the homeowner to move into it and to load in a completely occupied area. Now I'm talking about a crawl space where those those that those TGIs that are that are all held together with glue. Uh, to burn and cause the, the, the floor to fall in when the firefighters go in the building, and they have no way to know that. And so much of our, I don't know, most of our new construction is probably trust towards my house, is that built that way? So it's fine. And mine came with an unfinished downstairs, and I'm very familiar with it. Is it still unfinished? No, it's finished, but it's Is it laminated, or do you uh, have solid wood? So, what's that? Laminated beam or solid wood? Laminated. Beam. And we didn't put the sheet rock up, thank goodness, because floor plan changed. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to afford it, frankly. Um, but um, my so my last question is if you could just for us for Tuesday night look into um, anchor specific. Um, I know they said they've been building like this for many many years. So if you could look into it and just vet those issues, because I'd like to know if they really have if we have examples in anchor that would be helpful. All right, thank you, Mr. Crane. Mr. Starr, it speaks to, to crawl spaces with storage potential as being applicable here. You're saying you're more confident that it's mostly the, the extended floor height 
for a walk-in basement, but if they have a lid and they throw Christmas stuff down in there, then you're going to say it's a storage okay. area. So through the chair, the, the fire department is not involved in inspecting the one to ten homes. Well, you're defending the topic, so but maybe it's the wrong person to ask. Right. Yeah, but if it has a hatch access to the get into the below the crawl space, the term storage facility, if what you're asking them to shoot out below the crawl space. To the chair, no, we would not require that. We did not assume that they're going to store in the crawl space. Well, that's why the clarification is if it's unfinished basements with walkable access available for man doors, that's one thing, but it, it reads crawl space is, a, is applied you know, with storage. So I want to be clear if we do an amendment on it to, to move towards the true hazard condition, it, where is the crawl space definition for you? Six foot crawl space with the hatch access is going to require the lid to be sheet rock. Through the chair, it would have to qualify as an occupiable space, meaning it would have to have the minimum ceiling height required by code. Well, you use the word storage in the writing of the code, so maybe we can clarify between now and whenever, but it talks about a crawl space with storage potential. Okay, well, the chain of crawl space is going to be over with. We need to head to the library.